evocatively entitled Napoleon the Great, which tells you his sort of conclusion on that, su on, on that subject. Uh, Andrew, you've previously dealt with high politics. You've covered Salisbury, you've covered Halifax, better known in India as Lord Irwin. Uh, what we, in a sort of old Namierite fashion, would call high politics. And now here you've moved on to something completely different. A politician who's a statesman, whose record has been principally on the battlefield, where action has mattered more than negotiations, or perhaps actions matter more than negotiations. What attracted you to Napoleon? And why Napoleon? Hasn't enough been written on the subject for you to revisit Napoleon again? Thank you very much indeed, uh, Swapan. Well, there have been more books written about Napoleon than there have been days since his death, um, <coughs> which, was over two, which was nearly 200 years ago. So one might actually think that, uh, that there must be nothing more to say about him. But in fact, the uh, Fondation Napoleon in Paris has been bringing out a new edition of all of his letters, some 33,000 letters that uh, Napoleon wrote during his lifetime. And what we're able to see from this is a new aspect to, to him, and especially the way in which he was able to compartmentalize his mind. He was able to think about things entirely and then totally different things a few minutes later um, and concentrate on them with exactly the same uh, force of uh, mind. A highly intelligent man he was anyhow. Um, and this was um, an aspect really of Napoleon that I found completely fascinating and really wanted to, uh, to write about and to explain to people as well as many other uh, aspects of his extraordinary personality. Your book is entitled Napoleon the Great. So there is obviously an implied admiration of that man. Which aspect of Napoleon, in your view, constitutes that greatness, the singular point? It was a, it was a controversial title because most British historians think of Napoleon as a sort of proto-Hitler figure, a, uh, a, a, an evil, uh, sinister figure. But the, and I actually, as a, as, a, as a Briton, as a British historian, started off thinking uh, that as well. But frankly, it was completely impossible to sustain once I had spent seven years uh, writing this book. He clearly was an extraordinary man and an admirable man. And the reason that he's um, admirable, to answer your question, is that he took the best parts of the French Revolution, uh, equality before the law, uh, religious toleration, meritocracy, these ideas, ideas which today we take for granted, but which in the Ancien Regime of France uh, were, were revolutionary constructs. And he, uh, he saved them and he protected them for the period of his rule and he extended them to the point that they couldn't then be um, destroyed once the Bourbons came back to power after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. However, as well as keeping the best bits of the French Revolution, he also discarded the mad bits, the 10-day working week, the cult of the supreme being, and the terrible reign of terror that uh, cost 40,000 lives at the hands of the guillotine in the French Revolution. So that was something that I admired, the way, in fact, he was a modernizer at the same time, of course, as you mentioned, uh, that he was fighting uh, endless battles. He fought 60 battles of which I've managed to visit 53 of the battlefields. Well, I'm glad you've uh, brought it straight onto the subject of Napoleon, the military, uh, what should I say, the, the, Napoleon, the military man. And really, I think even in the chapter headings of your books, it's all about the various battles. There seems to be, while you're talking about the, the extent to which Napoleon deviated from the extreme Jacobinism in which he'd been brought up in. 
his real contribution as far as the book is concerned really is about the battles. Now, do you really see Napoleon, the military man, as being the most important facet of his life? Was he a, was he a, does he compare as a military general to some of the greatest? Uh, he's certainly one of the great captains of history, military uh, commanders and leaders in history. And I go into the way in which he uh, used his extraordinary uh, leadership capacities and techniques and sort of secrets of leadership to, uh, to lead people. But I would take issue with you. I don't think this is a primarily a military book at all. I, I think it's much more a book about uh, the ideas that, um, that Napoleon promulgated, the code uh, Napoleon which set out a legal code which um, most of Europe was to, um, was to follow and, and even after he fell was to hold on to. Um, to an extent that it could be argued that the Code Napoleon is the, uh, is the primary um, jurisprudence drive behind the law of the European Union today. When one looks at um, Paris today, much of it is Napoleonic. When you go there, you'll cross over one of the bridges that he built, um, or you'll see the uh, fantastic um, military arches and, uh, and beautiful buildings and streets that he built. You can see the Légion d'honneur, the greatest um, chivalric order in France. That was his creation. The Conseil d'État, which meets every Wednesday to vet the laws of France. That was his creation as well. Um, in so many aspects of even modern-day France, 200 years later, uh, the Banque de France, for example, it was instituted by Napoleon. You see this man um, modernizing his country and doing it, uh, doing it so successfully that still the institutions he created are around 200 years later. So yes, there are a lot of battles. Of course there are. He was a soldier. Um, but it's really in his private and personal life and in the institutions and ideas that he promulgated that I think this book uh, um, stands or falls. It often seems to me that you're almost implicitly suggesting that Napoleon anticipated the tradition of liberal imperialism, which marked, say, for instance, some of the British statesmen of the Victorian age. Yes, there's undoubtedly um, a sense in which he was the liberal imperialist. In fact, I call him the Enlightenment on horseback because he couldn't put forward these enlightened views unless, of course, he was winning the battles in these endless wars, seven coalition wars that were declared against France between 1793 and his fall in um, 1815. The fascinating thing is that although he was a, uh, a soldier, he was the first person to try to make peace uh, once the wars were, um, were over. He really wanted to spend his time rebuilding France rather than just going on endless campaigns, except for on two occasions, the Peninsula War of 1808 to 1814 and the uh, famous um, attack on Russia in 1812, which led to the retreat from Moscow. Those were his wars, and um, they were both uh, disastrous for him. Yet the impression which his contemporaries had of Napoleon was that his sense of French expansionism was so profound and he almost believed that you know, it, France had a divine sort of mission to occupy about half of Europe and split it up with Russia perhaps. Uh, well, it wasn't, um, it, it, I don't believe that he saw it in terms of a manifest destiny particularly. Um, it was just that all these uh, powers, the, the monarchist powers, Austria, Prussia, uh, Britain of course, and uh, Russia kept declaring war on him. And uh, at the beginning stages at least, uh, they kept losing. And so as a result of the peace treaties, he would take more and more of their lands and would impose the Code Napoleon, would impose freedom of religion. His armies marched into the various uh, uh, cities in Europe. And one of the first things they did was to liberate the Jews, for example, for the first time in a thousand years. These um, people were given civil and religious um, liberty. And this would not have happened had it not been for French troops in foreign capitals. That's a, one of many examples of the ways in which he imposed the Enlightenment 
um, through force of arms. But he didn't start these wars, except for the two that I mentioned. The other wars of coalition were all started by um, reactionary uh, nations, European monarchies, who couldn't stand the idea of the French Revolution, wanted to extirpate it. They hated the concept of meritocracy and, uh, and equality before the law, and they declared war after war after war on Napoleon. Well, it's interesting you use the term enlightenment on horseback because there's one facet of Napoleon which is very interesting and where there's a sort of mixed record of him sort of deviating from the ideals of the revolution and which is his relationship with the Catholic Church, which really mattered in the 19, early 19th century. Uh, how do you view his sort of choppy, up and down relationship with the papal authorities. I, I see it um, very much as one of the less attractive features of his statesmanship. There's un, it was undoubtedly deeply opportunistic. First, when he went back on the French Revolution concept uh, of, um, of abolishing Christianity because he brought it back and that was an enlightened thing to do, to allow people to open their churches and to pray uh, again and to worship their, um, their god in the way that they wanted to, which of course, being the vast majority of Frenchmen being Catholic at that time, meant the resurgence of the Catholic, uh, the Catholic Church. And then he was crowned in a, a great Catholic ceremony uh, presided over by the Pope, although as the, as the exemplar of the self-made man in history, he in fact crowned himself at uh, Notre Dame, not the Pope. And um, as the uh, as time went by, and certainly as he became more and more powerful, and as the, um, uh, the nature of Italian politics became more and more complex, he wound up in 1809 having the Pope arrested and taken to uh, Fontainebleau, one of the great uh, uh, palaces in, in, outside Paris, and basically kept there as a prisoner for the next four years. So um, I think if anything, um, you were understating it when you said that he had a complicated relationship with the Catholic Church. Yeah, uh, obviously, I don't know whether anti-clericalism formed a feature of the contemporary image of Napoleon in Europe, but obviously at some point there was a definite Bonaparte phobia which gripped Europe, or at least parts of Europe, and which coexisted simultaneously with large numbers of smaller countries, particularly Poland, parts of Germany, which actually looked up to Napoleon as uh, Napoleon's victories as some of their avenue of redemption, national salvation. Now, how do you reconcile and what, what formed the basis of this phobia? And uh, I mean, you've explained what constituted the attractions of Napoleon. What was really the phobia about? Well, very often it was uh, the ultra-Catholicism of countries. You could have uh, uh, included Spain, of course, as well in that, because it was Spain that he invaded in 1808, which were very Catholic countries anyway, like Poland and Italy, and they used the, um, the church as a focal point, a rallying point for opposition to uh, to the French, which, uh, of course, because the French Revolution had been considered was a uh, anti-Christian and atheist movement, um, it was a natural way to get uh, nationalist feeling up against uh, against French invasion was to use the church. And um, he was very cynical and opportunistic when it came to uh, manipulating the church, just as on occasion the church was pretty cynical um, towards him. I think one of, his, one of his best jokes, he was a very funny man, Napoleon made endless jokes. There are about 80 Napoleon gags in this book. And uh, one of his best gags was when the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris wrote to Napoleon an incredibly oleaginous letter, immensely sucky up letter, in which he uh, said that he um, hoped that he would have the opportunity to die for the emperor. And um, it's very unlikely to see any circumstance in which a cardinal archbishop is going to be called upon to, to die for, um, for Napoleon. And Napoleon wrote in the top right-hand corner of this, uh, of this uh, letter, um, please pay 6,000 francs to the cardinal archbishop out of the theatrical fund. 
Well, as you pointed out, you know, Napoleon was a prolific writer. I mean, he was a prolific letter writer. He wrote something like 30, even in the midst of his battles, he wrote. And uh, some of the most revealing letters are those which you somehow discount as something of a bit of a propagandist tone, which is letters which he wrote to Josephine. Now, the relationship between Napoleon and Josephine, a part of contemporary mythology, best summed up in that phrase, not tonight, Josephine. Uh, which he never said, by the way, uh, not, uh, not during his... It, it was first heard in 1835, uh, many years after his death. About his relationship with yes. first Josephine yes. and then with a galaxy of other people. A galaxy of, of other people, you're right. And, um, it seems like a, uh, one of the great Romeo and Juliet love stories of all time, um, uh, this one between Napoleon and Josephine. And the only trouble is that she was in fact unfaithful to him within weeks of their marriage in March 1796 with a young, uh, dashing Hussar lieutenant um, called Hippolyte Charles, uh, who one of their contemporaries said had all the charm of a wig maker's assistant. Uh, and um, when he discovered about this affair, in, when he was deep in the Egyptian desert in 1799, he was um, devastated because he'd been writing these endless, incredibly erotic, immensely um, powerful, passionate, sensual love letters to Josephine. And he realized that whilst he'd been writing these, including, as you say, during a battle uh, on one occasion, um, he was, during the Italian campaign, he was, um, uh, Josephine was in love with somebody else. And so this was crushing for him. And what he did was to um, respond by embarking on the first or a, a series of affairs, the first one when he was uh, in Cairo, uh, and ultimately there were no fewer than 27 mistresses, um, two of whom actually are, are named in this book for the first time. It's quite clear that they were mistresses. He, um, he used to pay uh, his uh, girlfriends uh, huge amounts of money out of the public finances. And so he would, um, and there are lists of, 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 of women he would uh, give enormous presents to. And um, that, of course, um, crushed Josephine, who by that stage had fallen out of love with Hippolyte Charles and back in love with Napoleon. And uh, the whole, um, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, I've just seen there a whole load of monkeys on that, uh, on that roof. I haven't seen them. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and they add to the audience. Um, it's, uh, where were we? Oh, yes, mistresses. Um, there was a, uh, a, a true sense in which he was um, then uh, uh, able to make one of the most terrible mistakes, which was to marry the daughter of the Archduke, of the uh, Emperor of uh, Austria, the Archduchess, Mary Louise. And he divorced. Josephine, who is his lucky star, his, uh, his talisman of good luck. And uh, this was one of the reasons that he ultimately attacked Russia rather than Austria. Austria, who he had defeated four times before and instead was drawn into the snows of Russia, which ultimately, of course, led to his downfall. Uh, in dealing in his relationship with his mistresses, as you've quite rightly pointed out, Napoleon failed to draw a distinction between his private profligacy and state funding. And it seemed that nepotism, attachment and gratification of his family formed a very central part of the style of Bonaparte. Yes. And it was very against the larger republican ideals which you spoke about. Absolutely. Yeah, this was another example of the way in which he, he turned his back on the revolution because he kept making his family um, into kings and ruling dukes and duchesses and princesses. And unfortunately, they were uniformly useless. Um, of all his brothers and sisters, none of them were any good. And, uh, and yet he kept promoting them in a, very, um, in a very 19th century, early 19th century way. 
In fact, there's another marvellous joke of his where he was having dinner with them, and all they ever did was complain. Even though he promoted them, he gave them lands, he gave them titles, he gave them huge amounts of money, uh, and kingdoms in, on three occasions. And, um, and all they ever did was to complain and moan and, uh, and uh, ask for more. And the dinner one evening... Uh, with them after they'd, after they'd uh, spent the entire dinner complaining they weren't being given enough lands. And this is a middle-class family from Corsica, you know, who under, had it not been for Napoleon, they'd have had nothing. They were broke for most of the, the, uh, of the time otherwise. Um, and he shrugged and he said, you'd have thought that I'd misappropriated the legacy of our late father, the king. <laughs> well, his mother had some cutting words about that, if it lasts... Yes, exactly. Uh, when his um, mother was asked uh, about the, uh, the family fortunes, she, she said that it was all very well and it, she, was, uh, she was enjoying it and it was great um, for the family and then waited a second and then said, if it lasts. And it seems that, uh, I mean, if anybody else had said that, if a minister or a marshal had said that, um, it, it would be in the end of their jobs. Of course, you can't sack your mother. The other associated feature of Napoleon, which is quite at odds with his origins as well as the ostensible republicanism which he advocated, was his personal opulence. Not personal in so far as his clothes were concerned, but more in terms of his style of living, the umpteen palaces which he maintained, etc. Can you say something about that? Yes, he had 34 um, palaces which um, might seem like an uh, uh, unnecessary luxury, but um, his argument was, and also he used to wear these fabulous costumes. One of the uh, attractions of this book is the illustrations of the, of the incredible opulence of the Napoleonic uh, First Empire court. And the reason that uh, he did this, or at least the reason that he said that he did this, was in order to save the uh, luxury goods industry of France, which had been absolutely devastated by the French Revolution. When they chopped off the heads of so many aristocrats, they were also chopping off the heads of the people who bought uh, silks and linens and, uh, and gorgeous um, clothes and had paintings painted and uh, operas um, uh, composed. So he very much felt that it was his duty to try to recreate these important French industries and the way he was going to do it was to spend, spend, spend the, um, the, the coffers of France. And the way he financed that was every time he won a war he would impose huge um, indemnities on the countries he conquered as well as um, especially in the Italian campaigns, demanding some of the most beautiful uh, paintings, the great uh, Leonardo's and Titian's and uh, Tintoretto's and the rest, to be taken to this new museum that he was going to build as the greatest museum of the world, uh, the Louvre, which, of course, today is one of the greatest museums of the world. In fact, if you say to anybody, name me an art museum, um, they will say the Louvre. And that was another of Napoleon's great uh, creations. His argument was that in order to see all these wonderful triumphs of Western art, um, you can do it in a few days in the Louvre, whereas it would take a lifetime to go to each of the little churches that he had looted. I mean, considering the recent controversies about the Kohinoor, the Elgin marbles, etc., I think Napoleon perhaps started that trend right from his uh, time when he took the artifacts from Egypt and then from Germany uh, and all and wanted to make the Louvre the, really the cultural center. He even uh, wanted Goethe to relocate to Paris. So was Napoleon a natural lover of art and culture or was, or was he just a great accumulator? Uh, I think he was an international lover of, uh, of art and, uh, and culture and he very much um, believed that he was doing the world a favour by bringing all these great uh, things together under one roof. And uh, a lot of, um, of British historians have complained uh, about, uh, about this and said that it was looting, which clearly, of course, it was. Um, but actually, I, it, it ill behoves um, Britons who uh, have the British Museum, which is packed with things that have been looted over the centuries, um, really to, uh, to complain. There's a bit of hypocrisy going on there, in my view. 
Now let's come back. Despite all his personal foibles, his excesses, his it's putting France into a state, into a converting France into a sort of permanent war economy. The public adulation in France for Napoleon never diminished. Now, if you were to go right back from the time of the 18th Brumaire, there was a certain legend of Napoleon which was created in the minds of people. What was this based on? This, um, this legend, you're absolutely right, it, it was created after the 18th Brumaire, which was the coup d'etat in 1799 that brought Napoleon to power. Um, it was based on his extraordinary capacity for uh, the compartmentalization that I mentioned earlier, I'll go into that in a second, but also, of course, his extraordinary victories, his military victories in Italy, one after the other after the other. He, he won 11 battles on the trot and didn't lose a single one. And um, that really was something that France wasn't used to um, and hasn't been used to after Napoleon, actually, to be frank. Um, and it's also something that gave him an aura of invincibility in the civil and political arena that, um, that he had originally won from the military side of it. And let me just go into, um, because it also ties into the, the earlier question that you asked, about this idea of the compartmentalization of his brain. Here was somebody who was capable, the night before the Battle of Austerlitz, his greatest victory in December 1805, as the uh, marshals and generals were getting ready for this uh, battle and as the men were all um, uh, cooking around the uh, campfires prior to this great battle against both the Russians and the Austrians, Napoleon was able to sit down and write the rules of a girls' school that he wanted to set up in Saint-Denis, just outside Paris. Whilst he was in the Kremlin in 1812, after he'd captured Moscow, and the Russians had set fire to uh, Moscow and burnt down two-thirds of their own co-capital. Even then, he was able, in the, in the ashes of, the, uh, of, of Moscow, in the palace of the Kremlin, to write the rules of the Comédie Française, um, many of which, by the way, are also still in existence today. And when he was marching his army from Boulogne, where it was uh, intended to uh, invade Britain, over to Bohemia, in 1805, he also found, and this was the most extraordinary campaign because he plotted where every regiment, every village, every town, where every regiment had to be in, on each of the days of the six weeks campaign. And he did it all from a moving coach uh, as he went off to, uh, to war. And whilst he had all of this in his mind, he was also able to write to Pierre Forfait, who was the um, prefect of Genoa, uh, to tell him to stop taking his mistress to the opera. Extraordinary capacity for compartmentalization. Yes, I think it comes across as a man who, apart from being a grand strategist, which he may have been, was also a man who was obsessed with detail. And I think it was this detail, which your book underlines quite, uh, documents quite vividly, which is so useful in establishing a connect of Napoleon with his soldiers. And I think that... I yes, think you, his, you his, le his leadership technique with his soldiers was extraordinary. He worried about every tiny detail, about... Uh, he had a complete f um, boot fetish. Uh, he was obsessed with how many boots uh, each of the companies and regiments had. He understood how important boots were, of course, in a, uh, in a campaign. And he was constantly writing. I, I, there, can't be, there can be at least a thousand letters on, uh, on, on, the, on the footwear of his troops. But he worried about what they were eating. He worried about um, where, where, uh, the way they were being entertained, everything about them. And then during battles, he would actually stop and unpin his own Legion d'honneur and give it to somebody who he had seen being brave in battle and would give them a pension. 
he would um, sometimes shame his troops. If, if, a, if a group had, uh, a unit had, had broken and run away during a battle, he would have them all rounded up and harangue them and tell them that they were going to have um, dishonor written on their flags. And of course, this, uh, and it was going to stay stitched onto their flags until they'd done something brave, which actually, of course, had the um, power to make them then, for the next two or three battles, go off and be incredibly brave in order to get that sense of shame um, dispelled. He, he could understand the psychology of the ordinary soldier to a quite extraordinary degree. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very important facet. No, there was Napoleon, the ruler, the emperor of France. And after his final exile to, to, to St. Helena, a certain legend of Napoleon arose, which, was, which still has, which acquires currency even today. Now, what, how has that legend changed over the years, over the centuries? Well, the legend um, of Napoleon was a very positive thing in the, uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, his fall. Of course, the Bourbons tried to do everything they possibly can to expunge that legend. They, uh, they paid hack writers to write negative books about Napoleon and, uh, and make him out to be a monster. But that never really caught on, and the French still admire, at least the French on the right, Monsieur Sarkozy, for example, Dominique de Philpin, who's written a biography of Napoleon. These people um, very much still admire Napoleon. However, on the left, there's a much more nuanced stance towards him in France. Uh, not least because uh, the Code Napoleon was very patriarchal um, and, uh, and was... Um, therefore um, uh, very much considered, rightly so, to be, uh, to be negative towards women. Uh, and also, his, although he wasn't personally present in the campaign in Haiti, some terrible, monstrous, obscene war crimes took place uh, in, uh, under his, um, his generals. So they concentrate, the left concentrates much more on, on those aspects, understandably. Um, but in countries where Napoleon marched through, Russia, for example, there's, there's quite a Bonapartist um, sense. I, one imagines with Mr. Putin that that's not necessarily such a good thing. Um, but nonetheless, it's, uh, his, each country has taken um, the bits of the Bonaparte myth that, um, that they like the most and drawn inspiration from them, apart from Britain, which, of course, he never... Um, he never invaded, but nonetheless, that has a u almost uniformly negative um, view of him, which is why when I actually um, entitled my book Napoleon the Great, uh, was clearly going to be a red rag to a bull when it came to the reviewers. And sure enough, although all the books said that it was beautifully written and wonderfully researched, um, they also said that Napoleon was the equivalent of Saddam Hussein and um, Colonel Gaddafi. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this man could not be more different from that. He was a builder. He was a creator. He was a, a, a positive force in, uh, in civilization. Well, it's very interesting you point out how Napoleon is viewed differently in different places. And the footprint of Napoleon in India was through Tipu Sultan. And really it was Tipu's alleged inspiration from Bonaparte which guided him. But did Napoleon ever seriously believe after his Egyptian campaign that he would actually emulate Alexander the Great and enter India? Yes, he said he was going to enter India wearing a turban and on an elephant, um, and that he was going to convert to Islam. Um, when it was pointed out that this was going to involve uh, not drinking alcohol, uh, he's a Frenchman and he, and he you know, he had to think twice about that. Um, but nonetheless, it was a, um, it was something he claimed was going to be one of his, uh, his great, um, 
victories. In fact, he came out with this at Aleppo, which is a thousand miles away from, uh, from India. There are two great deserts in between. They, there was no, logistically no way that he was going to be able to lead his pretty tiny army, he was down to 13,000 men by that stage, to cross the whole of, um, of the continent effectively and, uh, and then take on and defeat uh, the British under Wellington. And um, so his letters to uh, Tipu Sultan were frankly uh, pie in the sky. But um, it, it got was, Tipu into a lot of it trouble. It got Tipu into a lot of trouble. And uh, eventually at the siege of Seringapatam uh, in 1799, it, it had him killed. So, um, yeah, in that sense, Napoleon's influence on uh, India was something that a lot of Indians might, um, might regret. But as an Englishman, I obviously think it was a good thing. Well, the self-image of Napoleon was that he was following in the footsteps of Julius Caesar, uh, Alexander the Great, and Frederick of Prussia. Yes, he had. This was the th this is one of the drawbacks again about the myth of Napoleon: the assumption that um, that he had a Napoleon complex, what Freud called a Napoleonic complex, which was um, that he became so hubristic that he couldn't stop himself from, uh, from continually to invade other countries. But actually, when one looks at the 1812 campaign, which is where the concept of the Napoleon complex came from, one realizes that, um, in fact, although there is such a thing as a Napoleon complex, Napoleon himself didn't have one. Um, he invaded Russia in 1812 on a number of completely rational reasons. First of all, he was never intending to go all the way to Moscow. He only wanted to fight a war, a 20-day war, some 50 miles inside the Russian border. Secondly, he had an army of 600,000 men, the largest army in human history up until that point, that he was able to attack with. It was the same size as the population of Paris. He didn't realize, uh, didn't know, how could he, because it hadn't been diagnosed, that typhus was going to kill uh, some 100,000 of his men of the central thrusting um, uh, column that was marching on Moscow. He was, it's a disgusting disease where a, a lice, a, a louse, first defecates and then dies inside the body. And uh, then you die in incredible pain three or four um, days later. And it wasn't diagnosed successfully until the year 1911, so uh, nearly a century after the attack. And um, he also allowed more time to get back from Smolensk, uh, sorry, to Smolensk from Moscow than he had um, taken getting uh, from Smolensk to Moscow. And the great drawback was, the terrible ha thing that happened to him was about 65 miles outside Moscow to the southwest at a battle called Malayaro Slavets. He was, um, he was effectively forced off the road that the Russians then used to escape, and he took the wrong road back to Smolensk, which led to the destruction of his army. But that was not a part of a, a, of a lunatic, uh, hubristic sense that comes out of the, um, the Athenian um, uh, model of ancient and classical literature and poetry. This was, in fact, a series of rational decisions taken that went horribly, horribly wrong. Well, hubristic or not, I mean, Napoleon did craft a style of his own. And I'm often intrigued by the artistic depictions of Napoleon with one hand inside his waistcoat. Now, what's the origin of that? And was there a rational thinking to it? Was yes. there some Caesarism at play? No, no. well, some, uh, it, it was not to scratch his scabies. Uh, as or the typhus. Was, as, uh, or the typhus, no, exactly. He wasn't scratching himself. Um, uh, he was, in fact, trying to emulate the ancients. Uh, he looked up very much to Caesar and, uh, and Alexander. And so he put his hand inside what was a, in, in, intended to seem like a toga. But of course, he didn't wear a toga. He wore a waistcoat, so he put his hand inside the, uh, the waistcoat. It was a, it was a deliberate um, attempt to make him seem like part of the, uh, of the great panoply of, uh, of history all the way back to ancient Rome. And it was the reason that he chose the eagle as his symbol. It was the reason that he called the upper house the Senate and so on. It was a conscious manifestation of, uh, um, 
of, of ancient Rome. And, but at the same time, one has to remember that this is a man who promoted meritocracy. Of his 26 marshals, no fewer than 13 of them were, uh, came from the working classes. Uh, they were the sons of barrel coopers and peasants and um, innkeepers and bailiffs. There was, a, 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 actually you could, add it, you could add one more, you could bring it up to 14, because Marshal Serurier, who claimed that his father had held a royal appointment, when you actually look into it, he was the royal, he was the, um, royal mole catcher. Um, so a majority of the marshals were people from the working class. This is the first time this has happened in French history for a thousand years. He was genuinely revolutionary in that regard. Somehow I get the very sneaking feeling that you're trying to impose a vision of one of your other heroes or heroines onto Napoleon, Margaret Thatcher, who also built up the Conservative Party, redefined the Conservative Party, but at the same time kept an element of the Ancien Regime with her. She was the Napoleon of her time. <laughs> You've often been accused and berated by the leftists, Marxists, etc., for writing history in terms of the great men and women of our times and forgetting that there exists a larger social context. Yes, um, the, uh, the great man view of history, of course, was, deci was decided by the Marxists and determinists in the 1960s that there was no such thing as the great man view of history and that great men and women were, um, were merely the, uh, uh, the sort of scuff on the top of the wave of, um, of the world. Napoleon is the personification of the argument against that. He was an individual, uh, a single man who took decisions that swayed the destinies of millions. And uh, if ever you need a, uh, a single example that completely undermines the uh, Marxist uh, or determinist view of history, it is Napoleon. So um, you're quite right, I have been criticized uh, for that. And my answer is just to say, Napoleon. Well, at the end of the day, Napoleon has certainly produced an eminently readable book, and I urge everyone, whoever who's interested in it, and who's interested in history as it should be written, to actually have a read of this book. Now, I want to, uh, I mean, obviously I've just touched a facet, a small fraction of what Napoleon stood for, what he epitomized, and what Andrew Roberts has written. But I'm sure there are many, many questions which people have of, of Andrew Roberts, his reputation, and the subject. Why? Well, can I can I um, just say one thing about his myth that uh, that lots of people get completely wrong, and that is the idea that he was a small man. He was not a small man, ladies and gentlemen. He was five foot six, which is precisely my height, uh, and um, without the hat. Um, and the reason that people think of him as a small man was because the British caricaturists, propaganda caricaturists like James Gilray and, and um, Thomas Romelinson and George Cruikshank, always made him out to be this kind of uh, midget figure. He absolutely wasn't. And I know that not least because when I went to St. Helena and um, I was making a BBC TV series about, about Napoleon, and uh, nobody was looking, and the docents had gone the other way, and the cameras had been switched off. So I lay down on Napoleon's deathbed, um, and I'm exactly the right height. Well, when the historian identifies so strongly with the subject, I think that's quite ominous. <laughs> uh, any questions, uh... sir? That gentleman, very enthusiastic. Uh, a simply wonderful. Can you please enlighten uh, whether it was true that it was Napoleon Bonaparte who was responsible to encourage Ronald Ross to bring in his smallpox vaccine? He was kicked out of the medical profession in England. It was Napoleon Bonaparte who thought it prudent to vaccinate his troops, and that's how the smallpox vaccine became a gift to the world. 
Can you tell us a little more about that? Um, it's, it's partly true. It was, of course, Dr. Jenner, a, a, a British doctor, who invented the uh, smallpox vaccine. And, but it was Napoleon who took on the idea. Uh, he was very open to the concept, to all the concepts of medical advance. He would give prizes um, for, for the best medical advance, uh, the best uh, advances in, with regard to electricity and other scientific um, discoveries. He was always at the, he wanted France to be the absolute cutting edge. Now sometimes this was for military purposes. Uh, his interest in ballooning, for example, was so that he could get a balloon up uh, above, behind a battlefield and see where uh, the enemy forces were. But nonetheless, um, and he also tried to get the first submarine working with disastrous consequences actually as it turned out in the Seine. But nonetheless, um, he was always very keen on things like vaccination that he felt would be able to uh, help the people of France. He got um, clean water into Paris for the first time, saving tens of thousands of lives through um, uh, the defeat of cholera, for example. Can you think of an Indian monarch or an Indian ruler that may come close to Napoleon, at least in thoughts? I think Akbar, uh, Akbar the Great, is the person who um, would uh, would be the closest. But I'm um, I'm not the uh, expert on Indian history. You've got Willie sitting there in the front row. I'm sure he's got some uh, some figure who he would say would be closest to, uh, to Napoleon. Um, I think there's nothing sui generis um, and European, necessarily European about Napoleon. I think that the, the ways in which he showed leadership, the ways in which he was able to um, bring people round to his side, the uh, ways that he was uh, able to politically compromise with people that he needed, and then, of course, ruthlessly uh, cut them down. Um, those, are, those are things, those are political uh, capacities that are useful, uh, are still seen today, are still seen in every, every nation of the world. There's nothing particularly um, European about the story of Napoleon. It really is a, a human story. Uh, that was an absolutely wonderful uh, uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, I have a sort of, a, you know, a what-if question. If Waterloo had gone the other way, and Wellington may well have lost Waterloo, could have, would we have had a French empire rather than a British empire in India? That's a very good question. Actually, what would have happened by the time of, wa of Waterloo is that um, as well as the British and Prussians who fought at Waterloo, some... 100, some um, 113,000 of them in all. Um, you and, and you're quite right, Wellington could easily have, have lost Waterloo. There are four or five different occasions when, uh, when he could have lost that battle. Um, but, uh, and I'm very happy to talk about uh, Waterloo um, later on if you'd like me to. Um, but the thing was that by that stage, there were also 150,000 Austrians and 350,000 um, Russians who were marching on Paris at the time. So even if he'd won Waterloo and had forced Wellington to bring back the uh, army into Britain from the Channel ports in the same way that we had to escape the continent in uh, Dunkirk in May 1940, uh, still he would have been faced with overwhelming sort of five to one odds. Now he had defeated five to one odds in the past. In the previous year in 1814 in his campaign outside Paris, he won five battles in four days days. Um, but it was a, um, a very, um, very unlikely that he was going to be able to pull it off again. However, let's, let's expand your question a little and go back to maybe 1802, 1803, or 1805, where had Nelson lost the Battle of Trafalgar and Britain been successfully invaded by Napoleon then, um, then yes, you would very much have felt a, a French empire in India rather than a British one, in my view. Uh, he would, um, uh, his, his uh, alliance with Tipu Sultan would have only have been a, um, uh, a short-term thing. And, uh, and instead of um, the uh, splendors of the British empire, you would have had the horrors of Algeria here. You wanted to talk a little bit about... You wanted to talk a little bit about Waterloo, is there any... Oh. 
yeah, the Battle of Waterloo um, was a, as, as uh, Wellington himself said, a damn close run thing. And the way in which you can see the ways it would have done, um, it would have gone uh, worse, gone, gone badly for Britain are, um, are many. First of all, one has to remember, of course, that it's not just Britain. It was an Anglo-allied army. In fact, only a third of Wellington's army on the day of the Battle of Waterloo spoke English as their first language. Um, the way in which the uh, squares, 13 squares, battalion-sized squares, held and not one of them broke was pretty extraordinary. When one looks at battles like Garcia Hernandez in 1813, you see two French squares broken because having, uh, and usually a horse, a charging, galloping horse, will not charge into a bristling row of steel bayonets. But on this occasion, uh, two horses were killed as they skidded into the front of the um, squares, knocking the infantrymen aside. And suddenly you have, inside the squares, uh, men on horses with sabers and lances attacking the entirely unprotected backs of the infantrymen as the squares break, at which point you can have up to 80 or even 90% casualties. Now, if that had happened and Napoleon had managed to smash through, or alternatively, if the uh, La Haye Saint farmhouse had fallen earlier in the day than 6.30 p.m., or if the Imperial Guard had managed to break through, or if the Prussians hadn't turned up uh, from 1 o'clock to uh, 4.30, staving in Napoleon's right flank, each of these things, or if Hougoumont, the farmhouse on, on um, the centre-left, on Napoleon's centre-left, Wellington centre right. If that had fallen and Napoleon had executed one of his extravagant um, manoeuvres, uh, outmanoeuvring Wellington, um, that too could have given him the battle. So there were, and, and Wellington was expecting that. He, he, he um, studied the battles of Napoleon and he saw the way in Napoleon had used the, man, um, the manoeuvres, the various. Uh, um, maneuver sur le derrière in, on two occasions where he was able to get his army even behind his enemy as at the battles uh, in Egypt. So it was not, it, it, there's nothing of course is um, inevitable in history. Um, in fact, the first day I, I turned up to my first supervision at uh, Cambridge, my Don Norman Stone told me, um, one thing you must always remember as an historian, Andrew, is that there is nothing inevitable in history, except for German counterattack. <laughs> that always is inevitable. However, nothing else is. And so um, we, were, we were lucky at the Battle of Waterloo. And I'm not putting it all down to luck, um, because Wellington was a superb general. He was in the squares. He, was, uh, he, he, he uh, rode 20 miles backwards and forwards across this three-and-a-half-mile front battlefield during that day. Uh, he didn't go into Hougoumont because he feared he'd be trapped in there, but otherwise he was at exactly the right place, teaching, telling the batteries where to fire, um, telling the regiments when to uh, stand up and fire. He was a fantastic general. I don't want in any way to... Um, uh, to denigrate his uh, performance on that day. It was flawless. Hello. Could you shed some light on, you know, uh, what was on his mind after he was exiled? Uh, yes, that's a good question um, as well. His, um, the question was, what was going through his mind when he was exiled? Well, the first thing was, uh, he went to this tiny island called St. Helena that is bang in the middle of the um, Atlantic Ocean. And you can't fly there, so the only way to get there is by boat. It took him 10 weeks to get there. Um, when I went to visit, it took five um, nights on a, um, Royal, Mail, um, a Royal Mail ship which um, was quite excruciating, not least because you had to sit next to the same person uh, every single meal for, uh, for these five days. And in my case, I had a Swiss railway engineer. Um, nonetheless, uh, he, uh, he had more fun um, going there, but he spent the most, um, the first thing he did was to write his memoirs. They are beautifully written and entirely untrue. Um, 
but nonetheless, it, they became the biggest bestseller of the 19th century. They outsold anything written by Dickens, they outsold Uncle Tom's Cabin, they outsold all of the great um, 19th century works that you can imagine. And these um, also went a long way towards creating the myth um, that was mentioned earlier by Swapan. And it's a, um, uh, so that was the first point. Then after that, he got into incredibly petty debates and arguments with the even more petty British, um, British governor of the island, Sir Hudson Lowe. They would argue over everything, and it was, uh, it was one of the least grand moments of his exile. And then, unfortunately, the poor man um, ca uh, caught the cancer or developed the cancer that had killed his father and was to kill his sister and killed one of his illegitimate children and was therefore very much in the family. It is a myth, ladies and gentlemen, that he was uh, poisoned by his, uh, by his valet or by um, his, uh, his chamberlain. Well, the final question, um, maybe the lady there. Maybe slightly off topic, but I'm wondering if you know whatever happened to Napoleon's descendants apart from, uh, you know, the one who took no, over no. after yes. the he had, um, he had one legitimate son, uh, the King of Rome, Duke, Duke of Reichstadt, who died of tuberculosis aged 21 in 1832. And he um, had two illegitimate um, children, male children, um, and one daughter, uh, we're not absolutely certain that, that the daughter is his. Um, she's buried in a, in a um, graveyard in Brussels. She was, she was only, I think, seven at the time of her death. Um, and then the two illegitimate children had rather illustrious um, careers. One of them became Prime Minister of France, British ambassador, French ambassador to France, and foreign minister under Napoleon III, um, his illegitimate uh, step um, uh, cousin. And the other um, actually had a series of, uh, of children, um, and, um, and actually, funny enough, uh, two of them are living in London today. And it's completely impossible. If you were walking down the street, uh, you would stop and stare and go, oh my God, that's Napoleon. Uh, it's quite extraordinary to see the, the physical family resemblance. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It's, very, it's been a complete delight. And yeah. if there's anybody who got any more questions, I'll just do, uh, do ask me I mean, later. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this wonderful and riveting talk. Just as a matter of information, Andrew, having covered the defining figure of the 19th century is going to do a biography of Churchill. He's undertaking that. Uh, the defining figure of the 20th century, some would argue, which will certainly have a lot of people gnashing their teeth and throwing, you know. But just since If they must, they must. <laughs> <laughs> since we've got you, maybe in a few sentences, you can give a curtain raiser as to what your next book and why, once again, Churchill appeals to you? Well, unfortunately, uh, Winston Churchill wrote eight million words and spoke six million. So it is a, a, an absurd task to have, uh, to have taken on. There are an, at least a thousand biographies of, uh, of Churchill as well. But um, there is still extraordinarily so much that's still being discovered about uh, Churchill, including something that is, that is pretty um, sensational, which I'll come back to the Jaipur Literary Festival to tell you all about. But um, nonetheless, he is a riveting character. The sense of humor is, of course, um, make, makes the um, thing very pleasurable. The deep controversies Clearly, um, nobody knows this better than uh, Indians with regard to the Bengal famine of 1943. Um, deep, important issues that need to be, uh, need to be addressed uh, and grappled with when, in uh, Churchill's life. But also, underlying it, and something that I found, again, in Napoleon, an extraordinary energy um, and a capacity for leadership, which was... Um, built around being able to get his supporters to believe that they were taking part in history, uh, in the making of history. And if a, if a great leader can achieve that, then um, there's hardly any limit 
to the things that he can achieve. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, once again. And I think that's warm applause. I think it's worth recording because I think it's uh, worth noting that Andrew Roberts got a very warm, enthusiastic response in Jaipur, which sort of upsets a lot of caricature of the man. And I think someone is going to be gnashing, not in this country, but in your home country. Please put your hands together for Andrew and Swafan. Andrew will be signing his books just over at the author's signing tent if you'd like to ask any more questions or you have your copy of your book, which you can purchase.